<clears throat> Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. Uh, we broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's okay. We do record the show every week, as we are doing this morning. And it will be available on our website for you, for anyone to watch later, hopefully by the end of the day today, if everything cooperates. Um, both the live show and the recorded show's archives are free and open to anyone to watch. So please share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the shows we have um, put on here. Uh, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska, and that is for all types of libraries in our state. So we provide support and training and consulting to um, public libraries, academic, K-12, uh, museums, correction facilities, um, and it's a special government, anything that's a library we provide services to. So on our Encompass Live show here, we have topics that will be of interest to all those types of libraries. So you will find things all across the board. Uh, really, our only criteria is that it is something for libraries, something a library is doing, something we think libraries should be doing. Um, we do demos of services and products sometimes, uh, book review sessions, mini training sessions, um, so it just really runs the gamut there. It's, um, you'll, you'll find something for, any, for everybody, I would think. Sure. <laughs> um, that we do bring in guest speakers sometimes from outside of the Nebraska Library Commission, outside the state. But we also do um, have our own Nebraska Library Commission staff that put on presentations sometimes. And that's what we have today. Today with me is Amanda Sweet. Good morning, Amanda. Good morning. She's got her coffee. She had her breakfast sandwich. We are good to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she is our technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. And she has a new-ish, some soon we'll stop calling it new, it's been six months or yeah, so. Yeah, around about. Um, once a month, um, one of our shows on Encompass Live is uh, Amanda's Pretty Sweet Tech session. Um, get that sweet tech. <laughs> um, it's now officially the, the last Wednesday of the month. The last Wednesday of any month will be Pretty Sweet Tech. So if you are a techie type person and you're interested in anything like that, um, they're on our calendar um, going out every the last Wednesday will be hers. Um, the topics will be loaded and announced on there as soon as she has them. You know, she doesn't have things planned out six months in ahead, but um, as she decides the topic is, the, more, the full information will be loaded onto that particular uh, Wednesday's a description. So um, I'm just going to hand it over to you to tell us how to use the power of the internet wisely. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So the internet can do a whole lot of things. Like what we're doing now. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but the whole thing is we're starting to get a better idea that the internet has a great amount of power, everything's going digital, and everything's transitioning over. We have to learn all these new skills, and there's a ton of resources out there that show what these skills are. But now, how do we actually use and apply the information that we're learning? And that's what this is all about. I found out that if you run a library program that says, like, Learn your privacy and security skills. Nobody cares. They That's don't show up. Boring. Yeah. Sounds boring. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it sounds boring. It sounds tedious. It's things that no one actually wants to know. So it's kind of, it's like digital literacy is like the cough medicine. You know <laughs> that you should take it, but nobody wants to. But then people start caring when their identity gets stolen. Mm-hmm. So how our goal as, a libra as librarians is to find out how to get this information to people before it becomes an emergency. People Be walk prepared. In, yeah. People walk into the library with information needs. But when this stuff becomes a need, not good things are happening. So we're going to go over kind of the major categories of digital literacy, which I'll get into when I actually transition over to the digital literacy guide that I put together. And it's a lot easier for you to remember what these skills are and to have a visual connection between what this actually means when you're actually looking at it. 
I could spout off a list of categories. Doesn't mean anything. <laughs> and then, so once we get these categories together, we'll start actually looking at your own individual community and finding out the different categories of people that you're working with. Are they adults? Are they children? Are they older adults? And at what stage of life are these people in? And what kind of activities are these people doing? And why would people actually care about these skills? What would get people through the library door? Mm -hmm. So say, for example, we were talking about that privacy and security stuff. But that's not just a separate skill. It's not a floating category that just needs its own event. It should be integrated into all life skills. Mm -hmm. So if you are doing a session on retirement skills or you're doing a session on personal finance for teenagers, that's where privacy and security can get tucked in. People are already learning about how to manage their finances and why that's important. Online finances is a digital skill, but that should be paired together with cybersecurity. You don't want to get your identity stolen. You don't want your credit card stolen. You don't want bad things to happen there. So the general order of this is the main meat of this is going to be number three, review those digital skills. But I start with why and who cares to frame the way you're looking at these digital skills. Think about the children that might be looking at this and then think about if schools are already covering some of what, you're, what we're looking at. Work with them, yeah. yeah. Because this digital skills are huge. And you don't want to compete with other organizations in the community and duplicate resources that are already there. Why not just work with them? It takes the load off the library itself, and it also builds a better community. And then as you learn these skills, think about what a digital citizen actually is. That's probably going to be different for each different community. You can Google it and find a definition for a digital citizen, but it's hugely broad. Mm -hmm. It means absolutely nothing until you actually start to apply things in real life. All right, so mm -hmm. when you're actually doing the planning process, we'll go back to our who, what, when, where, why. It's a classic. <laughs> it works. So who walks through your library doors right now? What kind of programming do you already do? And how can you integrate and adjust these programs to fit these new skills? How do you turn digital literacy into a way of life? And throughout this, pro throughout this webinar, I'll be talking about if this stuff is actually important to you. Nine times out of 10, it will be. But what actually makes people act on this stuff? And then once you know what's important and you know what matters and why, how are people going to find out you're doing it? If your library wasn't actually doing some of this stuff before or you're adjusting the way things are being done, how do people that didn't go to the library know that you're starting to do this? And how do you use these digital skills and and coding is also one of these, too, to actually bring people in through the library doors. And then timing is everything. You can do a mm -hmm. rando project or a rando program. But what else? What are other things in the community? What else is going on? What can you play off of to get the timing right to connect people with the skills they need? And more, off, more, most importantly, why does it matter? I use the quintessential teenager because that's the most difficult market to get into the library. But they also, they've done a series of surveys through Common Sense Education and through Pew Research, and teenagers actually want more guidelines to start using their devices. They're completely lost. I go. I think digital native, digital native is not a real thing. No, it's it, no. it doesn't. It does the 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 stereotype of they are they're born. Do they just know how to use it? No, 
they don't. <laughs> they know how to do a few things that they've been using because their friends use it, or it's easy and quick to just you know, post something to your Instagram. I, you can swipe right. You can swipe, yeah. yeah. But there is so much more to it, and there are so many things that they do not know. And if you yeah. see places where they're talking online, um, teens or the, the millennials, as they call them, yeah. um, people who supposedly were you know, born with a phone in their hand, <clears throat> they are begging for I don't yeah. know how to do that. Stop saying that I do. Yeah. <laughs> it's not real. Yeah. And when you hand <clears throat> the, this new technology over to this younger generation and you tell them, oh, yeah, they know everything about this. They can learn this and then they can teach us. We're also kind of sending the message that you're not going to get any help from me. Mm -hmm. And you're on your own. And that's how, that's yeah. not good. And I've seen different iterations and different phrasings of that same concept, and I've seen that just across the board, not just in the state, but nationally. And there are those, there are schools out there that are just kind of handing these devices over, and then you turn the student into the teacher. Mm -hmm. But you're, you're doing that to take the load off of the teachers because they're already overstretched. And then you're putting that load onto the student. But now, does the teacher that's already overstretched have the time to oversee the student that is just trying learning to teach these skills? themselves? Yeah. And they don't. They already are assumed to be a digital native, and they're assumed to be comfortable with technology. And now they're afraid to say that they're not. Mm -hmm. And even if they did say that they're not, they just gave. They were given this responsibility. They don't want to lose it. And I don't have any research data that supports that right now. I'm still <laughs> digging around for it. It hasn't oh, it's been all done. New. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I've seen it. I've seen it in libraries across the state as I've done makerspace training and they brought in high school volunteers that get this technology just thrust upon them. I've seen it at conferences when people have talked about these programs that they start putting more responsibility on teenagers and on six to eighth graders. But in some ways, that's amazing. In mm -hmm. some ways, it's incredibly effective, and in some ways, it actually does build responsibility and helps encourage skill building. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, what are you telling adults now? Adults don't have to do a thing. <laughs> so that's not mm -hmm. a universal blanket statement, yeah. but it's just, it's one of those hidden messages that goes in there. <clears throat> so now what are these magical skills? <laughs> so I put together this digital literacy guide and it's kind of still a work in progress because when I put this together, I realized that I should start with why myself. So as I go through these different categories here, I start with what? And I started to use these statistics to say why this stuff actually matters. But after I put all this stuff together, I realized that it's not tangible enough. Mm. There's no real use cases that I actually led with. When I do my in-person sessions, I use in-person real-life studies, like real-life scenarios. Mm -hmm. Like, why would privacy and security lead a patron to walk into the library and what would make them take action to ask for information? That would be, I think my computer got hacked. I think I have a virus. What mm -hmm. is a virus and malware? Mm -hmm. And what do I do if I just got this data breach notice in the mail? Those are the right. actual scenarios that would bring someone into the library. And I actually realized that just pretty recently. Like I put all these resources together to show mm -hmm. what a digital footprint is and to show what, where your data is going when you actually go on the web. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's good to have that information, it is. Mm -hmm. But where's the relevancy? And that's kind of my challenge to the librarians that are out there because I'm just one person. And there are a lot of different communities out there, a lot of different libraries, but what are the scenarios that we're actually going to ask to make people take action 
and say, I this digital footprint is vital. I need to know where my information is going. I need to know who's looking at my data, and I need to know how this information is networked together. So when you go online, you go onto a website, you're being tracked by the website owners, then you're being tracked by third-party companies. You're being, you might be being tracked by data brokers. And data brokers are these third-party companies that scrape public record information. And then they buy and sell information and data that's collected by first-party websites. Then they kind of reorganize mm -hmm. and repackage this data and sell it out to other organizations. So these data brokers are gathering all of these little tidbits and nuggets of information and then sending it on over to like health insurance companies, background check companies, other advertisers, and places like that. So and that's actually it's getting to be more common knowledge, but mm -hmm. not everyone knows that yet. But if you did a library program that was just centered on a digital footprint and where your data goes, mm -hmm. It's a scary topic that no one wants to think about. Mm -hmm. And people don't will people will not actively go out to seek that information. So our job is to package it with something else. So people seek information in the emergency. But maybe we can just start putting this in when they start learning about how to use social media. A lot of libraries are already doing one-on-one -on -one training or group training for using social media. Just tuck it in there. And you can also have handouts that are available at the reference desk. And then you can also put it into children's programming and put it into just a variety of different ways. And so these are different ways that we can show what a foot, digital footprint is. Because it's also really difficult for us as librarians to learn all this stuff and then teach it directly. So the resources that I put on here, it gathers the information for you. And this one actually has different modules that will walk people through what this stuff is and why it matters. But the biggest thing is what gets them through the door to get this information in the first place. And then, mm -hmm. so this is just kind of like a general listing of categories here. And they're relatively self-explanatory, mm -hmm. like finding out what threats are online and finding out how to prevent them and then what to do when things go horribly, horribly wrong. <laughs> so, and just go up to the next category because these are they're relatively straightforward. And then communication and etiquette is actually tied to privacy and security. Because have you ever actually thought about all the different ways there are to talk to people online? Oh, like the different um, programmers places to go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So do we know one, the different ways to do it, but then when to choose those different methods? Mm -hmm. Do you want to get a text message that's a mile long? Yeah. No. But it does send necessary information. Mm -hmm. And do you actually want to get notifications all the time about all this stuff? So when I actually first started putting this resource together, I actually I turned all my notifications on to every single thing that I had actually signed up for. Wow. I know. <laughs> That's the kind of thing I do the opposite of. Yeah. I don't want I just yeah. did that this morning to some notification that's popping up from my Facebook. And yeah. I'm like, no, I don't need to be and I don't need to be told what that library is doing every day. It's you know I'm following yeah. them, and that's all. You know it's not my library, so it's yeah. you know. 
See, and the reason I did that is because if you don't have digital literacy skills, you don't know that you can turn these notifications off. Exactly. And you don't know, like, that you're just getting bombarded by all this mm -hmm. stuff. And I found out that I was getting an average of about 112 notifications every day. Wow. And then, so, I, then I went through and I started going, what's actually important here mm -hmm. to you? Yeah. Yeah. And do I actually want to check all of these? Do I want to check my chat messages? Do I want to check my voicemail? And do I want to log into Skype and find out if I have any messages there? Do I want to log into all these different places? Social media, there's always, mm. there's about a million of them. Oh, every one of them, uh, somebody can comment back to you on what you've posted. Yeah. Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, there's, you know. Yeah. yeah. And then I ask myself, so all this stuff exists. I set up this account maybe five, six years ago. Now I don't really use it that much anymore. But now I still have people trying to contact me there because they still use it, but mm -hmm. I don't. But I never communicated that I was no longer using it. Mm -hmm. And I never communicated that I had shifted over to something else. Now they were both on these two platforms and we're both still communicating on both platforms. But then I also have other people that are using other platforms. So how do we start to knit this in the bud and just kind of like get our digital community together and start cutting out the stuff that doesn't matter? Mm -hmm. So you don't get 112 <coughs> notifications in a <the> day <laughs> and that you don't have so many things competing for your attention. Because whenever you get that ding on your phone, did you know that it takes anywhere between five minutes and 20 minutes to get back on track after you look down at your phone, responded back to some message, and then mm -hmm. try to go back to what you're doing? We don't actually... Interruption. Yeah. yeah. And those are actually some studies that they were doing just recently through peer research to find out what's this doing to people. Mm -hmm. And well, are we thinking about it? And it's, it's a, I mean, that, I think, is an even something... I mean, there's more things that can interrupt you, but there's always been interruptions. Yeah. I think a lot of the, some sometimes a lot of these things, these internet-based things, people are like, oh, it's all something new, and we have to figure it all out because oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. No, your phone used to just ring and interrupt you and do the same thing. But you can easily silence. Your right. Phone. You can silence. You can silence your phone. You can silence your. You can silence your cell phones. You don't get those texts and things if you need to. I sometimes I have a in my office here. I have a we have a good old landline still that's our yeah. you know if I'm needing to do something and I need not to be interrupted I unplug it yeah. so it doesn't ring I get voicemails it's fine people can leave me messages but you know I need an hour to work on this report or project or whatever and I need to have my focus you can yeah. do the same thing with your with you know so with even that old fashion, old technology yeah. can, it's been around you do the same thing with your all of these notifications you do not have to be constantly getting nudged. You can, yeah, turn off the yeah, phone and then come back to it later and see what happens. And then we have FOMO. Yes, I know. <laughs> yeah. So FOMO, for those who don't know, fear of missing out. It's actually turning into mm -hmm. an anxiety complex. Mm -hmm. And it's actually biggest in teenagers right now because people, um, in the back of their mind, they know they should turn these notifications off and they know that they should just unplug and maybe like go out in the fresh air, but what are you missing? There's so many things we can hear about now because of all of this, these connections we can make. Yeah. You can hear the news about what happened in, you know, not just talking to somebody, and say, but, you know, what happened in New York, what happened in yeah. some other country, you know, what they discovered on Mars, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, that there's so many things that you can know about, and what if you miss hearing one of the really cool things? Yeah. And we now have, oh, let's see what it's actually up to here. Oh, yes. We have, oh, wow. It's actually growing a little bit. That is the total number of websites. 
1,724,840,550, yeah, yeah. And look at that thing that just popped up. Firefox stopped the social network from tracking you here. We were just yeah. talking about that. <laughs> and something is set up on this browser. I actually did switch all of my browsing over to Firefox just because I like their security and data tracking better than Chrome. Mm -hmm. But Chrome's still the most popular browser. Yeah. And I'm sure they're going to tweak it and get better at that and over time. Tech changes. <laughs> yep. So now we know that FOMO's a thing. We know we get way too many notifications. We know that we need to start building these social media profiles so that you put a positive spin on things and so that your future employers, future friends, future whatever will see you in a positive light. And then we know that miscommunication happens, but how do you, what do you do with it? How do you actually get people into the library to talk about the way they communicate? Mm. And the people they communicate with are largely in their immediate vicinity. They're within your community. And also, mm -hmm. is digital changing the definition of community? What does WWW stand yeah. for? Mm -hmm. World Wide Web. People have communities not just locally now. Yeah. I have a group, group groups of communities based on the online gaming I do. Yeah. A group of people that were all together in a group on Facebook and they're from all across the world. Yeah. That's just as valid and important and real a community as um myself and my friends here who physically get together yeah. and um, you know, hang out and go to pub night, pub quiz night at the bar, whatever. <laughs> um it's 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 the same, yeah. And then what about interacting with different cultures online? Mm -hmm. People greet each other differently in some places. And some people have different ways of like, not everyone shakes hands, which you wouldn't do digitally anyway. <laughs> but, but, yeah. but we have emojis that do that for us. If you send a shaking hand emoji to someone in another country, they're not always they going to know what that know means. what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And when you, so we built the symbolism system and we know exactly what this means. We know what all these different emojis mean to us. And then you start redefine, redefining these emojis in your own little personal group. But then you start using those same emojis and going global with it. And we're teaching kids and people to start reaching a global audience. And we're starting to teach them to create content and put their message out there. But if you put it on these global platforms, it's not always going to be interpreted the way that you want it to be. Or the way you think it, expect it to be. Yeah. yeah. So what I'm actually doing now is putting together different ways that you can introduce different cultures and get people thinking about what a global internet actually means. Mm -hmm. to them because you can tell people that they're going global all you want but the globe the world is such a huge concept it's so huge that it means nothing mm -hmm. the further away things get the less power you have in your own personal sphere and it also matters but it mm -hmm. still does just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there and especially if you're going into online finance and business. If you are, even for crafters that want to start posting their items online mm -hmm. to sell online, mm -hmm. we have a whole ton more maker spaces going on in libraries. People start making their stuff in the library and then they want to do something with it. So then you start packaging your product and you start putting it up on Etsy or eBay or different third-party sites and how do people find your stuff? What are you competing with? Who are you competing with? Are there other crafters? You're not just competing locally anymore. No. You're competing globally. 
and Etsy is a big place. Mm -hmm. And even if you're just competing within the U.S., you have other cultures that move to the U.S. And it's just it's just a mishmash. So that globalization is changing everything. And then once you start selling stuff online, what if you get scammed? What do you do with that? And how do you get that information to your library system? Mm -hmm. One way is to actually package online scam and online shopping information with Makerspace projects. If you mm -hmm. do a make and take, you can also put out these handouts to show what identity theft is and what different ways, different things to look for when you're shopping online. Mm -hmm. So you can actually print out like a top 10 list like this and then have people go over. So you just, have, you just made a whole bunch of different Makerspace stuff and you want to start making this stuff again. How do you go buy materials? What do you look for mm -hmm. on a website to go back find these materials? You can't mm -hmm. find them locally. They don't make the stuff locally. You have to bring it in. The, yeah, yeah. the pieces and the materials and yeah. what you're going to use, yeah. So you got people's attention. You got them in the door by doing a make and take. But now you just do a, five little, a little five minute blurb with a handout that says, you know, when you're looking for stuff later, try this. Shop smart. Now, I can see this one. You're talking about how do we get this kind of safety on the internet and working on the internet out to the um, our users, the people coming yeah. into our library who need to know this. And I can see this one being a good program or a class because there are so many people doing their own crafty things. Definitely. And you know they're out there. They're yeah. selling it. And they may be making that jump to this. And this is definitely one that a library could do. I mean, has anybody done any sort of program about how to sell your wares online? And, yeah. and, what, and that would be some way to then weave into it, like you were saying, the other things you need to know about being online, your online footprint, your online identity, how are you branding yourself online? Yeah. Um, so many things that can be discussed in the context of the thing that your users are actually really interested yeah. in that I make these, you know, crocheted soda can cozies, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, and, and then all my friends and family says I should sell them somewhere, and, and yeah. online's a good place to do that. So, and that's why I put together these different resources for starting an online business. Mm -hmm. Because libraries, they went to school for librarianship. They know librarianship. Not everyone has learned how to start their own small business, and not everyone feels comfortable leading a session about an online business. Mm -hmm. But you can go through and read the highlights from these different sources from people who have already done it, they've been there, and they've put together these different guides. And then you can bring people in the library together to start working through the guides that already exist. And then start looking through, and there's also different courses online that if people finish this session in the library and they say, this was amazing, but where do I get support to keep learning this and keep doing this? Hmm. And that's where we start shifting over to learning online. So this is going to send us over to just a slew of places that are offering courses online. So some of the bigger mm -hmm. ones are uh, Coursera. And so Coursera and edX, they're both a collection of courses that were made by universities. And there actually is, for many of them, there is a free audit option. So you can start taking the class, and then you'll get all the content and information, but you won't be able to go through the graded assignments, and you won't have the paper certificate that mm -hmm. shows that you did it. If you don't so need you have to, yeah, you don't need to hand that into someone for like continuing edu education credit with which some of your your people coming into your library. That's not why they want to learn yeah. this. They want to yeah. learn so they can sell their stuff online or whatever. Then that's perfectly fine. Yeah. yeah. 
And so if people are coming in for actual professional development, that they need something to prove that they, and they want to put it onto a resume, mm -hmm. they have the option of upgrading an audited class to a certificate. And depending on that, depending on the course and depending on the website, it can be anywhere between um, 50 and about 80 to to $100 to do it. And Future Learn's website, they actually have shorter unlimited learning classes that you can buy a year subscription, and you can take as many unlimited learning classes as you want. And if you finish a course and under that unlimited learning, you can earn the certificate and post that on there. So if you have people that want to do a whole lot of learning, mm -hmm. it's a good way to do it. But in these, you actually have different categories. And the reason I chose Coursera is because they have different business classes. And if people want to start their own small business, they don't necessarily need a full business degree, mm -hmm. but they can sure. choose the information they actually need. The basics will help, will help them. Yeah. yeah. And then, and they can also do, so they started doing, um, different master track style stuff. Mm. So it's actually just kind of like a miniaturized master certificate that's online. And it can lead it can also lead into a larger, more official looking master's program. But not everyone wants to get another master's and not everyone wants to <laughs> you know, spend two to four years doing that. They just need the skill. And so here's where the coding comes in. Udemy, Udacity, and some on Coursera and edX and Allison. Right now, there's like a craze about learning how to code. But one, what does code actually mean? Two, what are you using it for? Three, if you don't know what you're using it for, what code is and why you're doing it, how do you know which aspect of coding to learn? So when people actually ask me, I want to learn how to code, and they say, what language should I learn? That's and then I where say, you start. Yeah. nope. <laughs> I say, what do you want to do? Why do you need it? Why does it matter? And then they say, I don't know. Why does it matter? <laughs> and I say, that's something that's personal to you. It's something that's personal to your students. I can tell you some common reasons that coding is used, and I can tell you some common reasons that digital skills are used. I can't tell you why it matters to you. I can't tell you why it matters to your community. I can't tell you why it matters to your library. That actually requires more of a discussion. Mm -hmm. It requires looking deeper into the why. And what is our time here? Um, a quarter of 15 minutes. Okay. Well, we started a little late because our technical issues, so I'd say 20. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, for a full hour, yeah. So this is kind of what we're running into right now is there are so many digital skills out there that we can't just teach it all in person. No library on the planet actually has the time, energy, and resources to teach every digital literacy skill and every single skill that a community would need to thrive in a digital age. It just, mm -hmm. I wish that libraries had unlimited resources mm -hmm. and budget, but we don't. And now that brings me over to how does your community learn how to learn online? Have you considered mm. how learning in person is different from actually learning online? Because it is drastically mm. different. Mm -hmm. So in here, we go into e-learning industry. So right now, libraries and edX and Coursera, they're all putting together these different systems to learn online. 
but are people leveraging them well? Mm. Are digital natives leveraging, leveraging them well? Are you managing your time well and balancing your communication notifications with actively learning online? Do you have do you know how to set a goal for yourself and then chunk out that goal to finish the end of the course? And if you don't want maybe your goal isn't to actually finish every single assignment on these courses. Maybe it's just mm -hmm. to march to your own drum and actually mm -hmm. finish the project that you're working on. Mm -hmm. So how do we get this information over to library patrons? Because we may connect people to these resources, but if they don't have the digital literacy skills to navigate through the interface, or they don't have the digital literacy skills to budget their time, block out distractions, and if they're being attacked by malware and viruses all the time, how would they actually do all this stuff? So there is a possibility of if you do a makerspace and people get really, 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 really interested in one facet of learning, like if they start with Raspberry Pi and then they start learning how different sensors connect into Raspberry Pi, and then they want to find out how those sensors can start talking to a your device and learn how to use Internet of Things. Then they want to use like if this, then that. But then they say, I need more control over this, and I want to start learning how to use the protocol that makes it talk, makes the sensor talk to the device using Python. And then. There's about 20 different platforms that you can use to do that. So it's like, mm. so this is what people are running into. They start saying, okay, I want to do this. And then they get over to the next step. And then they want to do this and get over the next step. But if they're learning something completely new, they don't have a framework to know, I clicked on this resource. Is this information accurate or is it not accurate? Mm -hmm. And how do you know, and how would you be able to vet out different information sources? So how do we help patrons with being able to vet out these sources? You don't actually need to know every little perfect thing about how to do everything. You just need to know how to evaluate different sources. How do you know who's an expert online? How do you know if someone is just being satirical? How do you know if someone is deliberately generating bad information to lead you astray? Mm -hmm. Fake news. Yes. <laughs> so, and this happens not just with the news, but with pretty much every piece of information that exists on the planet. So we talk about fake news. But the guide can actually be used for everything. If you find a resource out there that tells you that you can learn to code in two weeks, <laughs> that seems a little <laughs> optimistic. <Yeah. laughs> and that's why this guide will tell you, does it seem a little sensationalist? Is there any other article that will back up that claim? Is this information current and up to date? And how do you actually go through and find out if that source is credible? And this definitely isn't new information. Libraries mm -hmm. have been doing this forever and a day. Sure. So this is our comfort zone. Finding out if learning resources and educational resources are accurate and if they come from a credible source, librarians are all over that. So we may not know how to do the specific coding and we may not know every bit of technology that exists on the planet, but we have a pretty decent idea of what's good information and bad. 
But now the next challenge is, can we do almost a reference style interview to find out where people are actually coming at technology? What do they actually need? And can we lead them toward a resource that will actually suit their need? And unfortunately, I can't tell you that in a 50 minute. <laughs> like, that's actually another resource that I'm working toward right now, the choosing and using technology. But I also have about, I have several mm -hmm. more sessions to actually narrow that down and start building better. It's mm -hmm. learning how to ask the right question and then learning the menu of technology that exists to know, to have that background information ourselves to be able to connect people with the information that they actually need. Because we're kind of quickly finding out that there really isn't a subject matter expert in technology. Mm. There's people that know a lot about it. There's about a million people that know more about every bit of technology than I do. But experts don't agree either. Yeah. I think that's something you, you've mentioned that you've discovered is you've been trying to narrow down and, and just nail down what's the digital literacy? What do we need to do? There's not a consensus. No. It, it, it's, there's so no. many things involved with it now as you from all the different sections you're putting yeah. into your guidebook here it, it, it's and everything inter intersects with each other and yeah know. and so all of these categories on the left overlap mm -hmm. exactly. so this online business and finance if you're starting your own business then that runs into digital law and regulation you mm -hmm. have a makerspace and people start grabbing images from online and then you get copy and paste fever Mm -hmm. and you start grabbing anything that looks cool, if you didn't know that copyright was a thing, which I really some hope people, people do. Yeah, I really yeah. hope people do, but I mean, some don't. Yeah. And also it gets murky. Or don't understand what yeah. it is. There is the, and you still hear the phrase, well, if it's on the internet, it's free to use. I've heard no. that. No, no, no. No, no. It, no. So much no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't mean anything, no. Yeah. No. And then, so you start getting different things like if you go into Google and you search for an image, a frog is my favorite animal before, <laughs> by the way, they're happy, and you go to tools and usage rights, and now mm -hmm. you get into copyright you land. Literally find the ones you can legally use. Yeah. Yep. But then you run in, this is where it gets murky. It says labeled for reuse with modification and labeled for non-commercial use with modification. Now the question becomes, so what is non-commercial? Can I use it for my library? Can I use it in my course? Do I need to get permission to do it? Or as long as I'm not selling anything, is it considered non-commercial? Mm -hmm. And if it's labeled for reuse with modification, how much do I have to modify it before it actually becomes my own? Mm -hmm. And does that actually mean that I can modify it and then sell it, or can I just modify it and then use it? And labeled for reuse is probably the safest one here. And then I also put in a guide for how to find free to use images. Yes. So these are actually different resources that you can access, and some of them you can actually print out to show that this stuff is free to use and that it's available to you. And probably the biggest one you'll probably want to look at is the Connect Safely. This will lead you over to a direct infographic that can be printed out for students or adult makers. And then Pixabay and Upsplash are two websites that are completely free to use the web the images on there. Um, Pixabay is actually one that I use a lot. Mm -hmm. And the reason is free for commercial use, no attribution required. It's like makerspace mm -hmm. gold. <laughs> And then we go back up here. Now, question, um, this 
digital guidebook you have here. Is this actually live yet? I know you weren't. You're still. You said it's still a work in progress. Is this a website people can get to yet? So it is not live yet, but if you grab this link, it actually is. So okay, if you so go directly to, through this link, okay, um, and it is this one here. So if you just go directly to that link. And I'm actually not even going to do a full handout. I'm just going to do these slides and then that link. Mm -hmm. Because, oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. honestly, I mean, the, made, yeah. the vast majority of this is just sifting through the different resources and then finding out how it actually relates to your own community. And finding out, I'll go down here. Yeah, so don't worry about trying to, if you didn't get that written down, I mean, yeah. you can if you want to, but um, you'll get, um, after the shows with the, with the archive, we'll get the, the slides, the link to the slides, yeah. and um, we'll put it, you know, the link to the actual digital literacy guide book that Amanda is working on will be, yeah. is in there as part of the slides. Um, but as you said, this is still a work in progress, too, yeah. so um, things may change on it as you're using it, so, yeah. and, and I think it'll always be changing because as new things come up. Yeah, so I mean, it's not going to be a, a locked in stone when she figures out, here's everything about digital literacy. I got no, it on there, and now possible. I'm done. No. It's not possible. <laughs> Things will change. Websites it's, will change. Yeah. And digital Resources literacy will come for up adults different. is different than digital literacy for kids, and digital literacy for college students is different from digital literacy for um, professional development and job skills. Mm -hmm. And digital literacy for job skills is different from digital literacy for retired and older adults, mm -hmm. and everyone cares about different things. So even if you were to go into like ISTE's resource for learning globalization for students or learning digital skills for students, if you try to adapt those skills over to adults, adults don't care. <laughs> they, they it's just not don't. there. It's not, it's not bad. It's not wrong. It's not a problem and, and it's just that's also something that libraries have always you, dealt with too with yeah. everything we've done we unlike some things like universities focus generally on adults yeah you know k-12 focus on children or whatever yeah um in libraries we have people from all ages from birth to 99 years old coming in and we know we've got to have things that focus for each one of each each age yeah. group and that's why this 50-minute overview session of digital literacy skills, it's a drop in the bucket. Mm -hmm. It's And that's why I actually put that guide together to actually start getting people thinking about who are you actually working with? So if you start this, this guide at the top and just think about the who and the why, why, who are you working with? Who goes to your library right now? What is going on in their lives right now? What are they trying to accomplish in life? And how can the library add value to what they're trying to do? Mm -hmm. Because everything libraries do. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a library to me. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and it's like, and honestly, with your, the, so in the state of Nebraska, you have to do a an assessment, the community needs survey, mm -hmm. and community needs assessment so for accreditation. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. a good it's that. chunk yeah. of it's done already. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at that, then you know what is generally going on, what the goals of your community are, and now you just need to take it a step further and find out the goals of the individual, and then find out how many of those individual goals overlap to make it worth building a project, to make it, make it worth making a project out mm -hmm. of it or making a program or doing an event. And mm -hmm. find out what is important enough to people to have them take action. That's pretty much mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Actually, yeah. it's 11.02 and I call yeah, that good. good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, anybody have any questions, last minute questions or anything you want to ask Amanda about while we're still here wrapping things up? As you said, you're going to have the link to this guide, so you can definitely go in and explore more. 
um, and there as you are, um, some of you may already be doing some of this training in your library. Probably. We know it's out there. Yeah, yeah this isn't something Almost like brand new. Yeah. But a lot of things here that can, I think, help people who have been, I know we've um, been doing some of these in-person workshops on this same topic, and people are struggling with some of these areas. Yeah, yeah they and know some stuff, and then it's good to have other resources. So, yeah. yeah. And then think about what your end goal is. What would be the perfect digital citizen? <laughs> Is there such a thing? Yeah, right? <laughs> so at the end of this, how do you want people, what would be your end result for people, what would people be doing if they had perfect digital skills? Mm. What would your community look like if you were using technology effectively? And then how can these programs build off of each other to make that happen? If you had a cohesive whole that led over into an ultimate goal, what would that be? And that'll probably be different mm -hmm. for every single community too. Mm -hmm. And I'd probably need to do like a community audit or a digital skills audit in, in each individual community to even build a yeah. program mm -hmm. that would fit. I can't give you a generic. That's something you would do in your library, yeah. in your community, yeah. But Okay. okay. Now yeah. I call that good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. So I think that will wrap it up for today's show. Nobody had any desperate questions to ask right now. That's great. This is a lot of info. Yes. A lot of good resources out there in the digital literacy guidebook. So take a look at it. Um, as Amanda says, things will be updated and added to it. So um, right now you've got the link. At some point it will be actually, what it's not as being live to us, not searchable on our website yet. If you right. just can get to it now if you have the URL, which we're giving you. So, yeah. yeah. Um, when it, yeah, I'm sure there'll be an, like more of an official announcement that, hey, this thing has been completed up to this point. And yeah. here's a new resource that'll be updated as needed for you. It's never really um, done. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's um, get out of here into one of our websites here. Somewhere in here should still be. What's going on? This one has a lot of links. There we go. There we go, Library Commission's website. All right, so that will um, wrap it up for today's show. Um, okay, great info. Thank you so much, some of this. Is. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to show on here, this is um, our Library Commission website, um, and it show has been recorded, and we will be adding it to our website. Right now, I just went up to the regular, um, yeah, my Google search up there. Um, so far, the only thing on the internet called Encompass Live is our show, so if you just use your search engine of choice, you will find us. Yay. Um, here is our um, website, and today's show has been recorded and will be added to our archive, which um, here is our upcoming shows, but underneath them is a link to our archive. And um, today's show will be at the top of this list. Um, we'll have a link to the recorded presentation, a link to um, the slides, um, and then within those slides, as, you said, as we showed you, the link to the guidebook will be in there. Um, Hopefully by the end of the day today, as long as we post our recordings onto YouTube, as long as GoToWebinar and YouTube all cooperate, I should have an email out to everybody who attended today and everybody who registered today um, about uh, the recording being available. We also pushed it out to our social media, as we were talking about. We do have um, you know, Twitter, Facebook, the usual places. Um, while I'm showing you here our archives, I'll show you we do have a search feature here. We can search just most recent year's worth, 12 months or the entire archive. This is because this is the archive for the entire history of Encompass Live. We started in January 2009, so going on over 10 years worth of archives here. Right. Uh, once a week, so 50, we do it 51 weeks a year. We take one week off for our state annual conference, library conference. So when you're going through our archives, uh, limit it to something recent or pay attention to the date. Everything has a date of when it was first broadcast. You will find old information, maybe outdated information, um, uh, websites might not work anymore, products or services may have changed completely or disappeared, no longer exist. Um, mm -hmm. Just pay attention to the dates on here when you are going through our archives. But we are librarians, we do archive and save things for historical purposes, so we'll always have these all out here for you. 
Um, so that will be our archive. We do have a Facebook page for Encompass Live, as I mentioned, that there is um, social media. So we post on there. Here's a reminder of today's show coming up. Um, when the no, I don't want to log in now. Thank you, Facebook. Um, when the recording is available, we will post it up on here as well. So if you do like to use Facebook, give us a like over there, and you'll keep up to date on what we're doing. So that will be it for today's show. I hope you join us next week when our topic is Feeding America, Garden Seed Exchanges, uh, Summer Meals, and More. Uh, Noah Lundstra is a uh, part of uh, a librarian in North Carolina who has this Let's Move in Libraries um, project program, just basically about doing projects and programs in libraries that get people out there and exercising and doing good, healthy things. Um, and he's going to talk about some of that with us next week. He'll be coming in remotely. He's not coming to Nebraska. <laughs> He'll be coming in remotely to talk to us about that. So please do register for that and any of our other upcoming shows we have coming up. We've got all the rest of this year's booked. I'm waiting for a couple of descriptions for December, and we'll get those specific topics up there. Um, and you can see we also have our pretty sweet texts um, on the calendar. As uh, when Amanda has her topics nailed down for the one next one coming in November, that will be updated with the information for it. So thank you very much, everyone, for attending. And um, hopefully we'll see you uh, another time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.